Turn it over to Sarah. Thank you, Anne. And um, let me thank the American Legislative Exchange Council for bringing us together for this very important topic. I also want to thank you for choosing to attend, you, the elected officials and the corporate members or the private members that are, that are here for this important topic. It's kind of fun for me to be back in D.C. with uh, former colleagues in the reform effort. Art and I served as warriors in the, on the Commission of the Future of Education along with um, our colleague Cheryl Oldham, who is here with me today. And Anne, of course, was at the center of our accreditation battles and, and, and carried those scars. I am delighted to be here. When Jeff Reed first called me, and thank you, Jeff, for thinking of me for this. When Jeff first called me, he said, Sarah, we really want to think about this from a number of perspectives. Number one, what is higher education's responsibility to developing the worker of the future? Number two, are students that are leaving colleges and universities, leaving with the relevant degrees, as well as the core knowledge that they need to have for today's economic uh, workforce. And then last but not least, the state of the relationship between the private sector and, and American higher education. I've had the luxury of looking across the relationship of the private sector, higher education, and students from three perspectives. Before I joined the Hispanic Scholarship Fund, I actually retired from AT&T. And one of my jobs at AT&T was head of human resources, where I oversaw and reshaped our college recruiting effort. At the Hispanic Scholarship Fund, my job was to go to the private sector and raise funds for Hispanic children, students much like myself, to go to college, pick the college, and then make sure that they had meaningful careers. And then, of course, as Ann mentioned um, at the end, I, I got to witness the, the policy conversations around higher education and higher education reform. Whether I looked at it from my corporate lens, from my not-for-profit lens, or from my um, federal administration um, lens, as we say in my home state, Houston, we have a problem. Um, whether we look at the quantity or the quality, that funnel is so narrow, and what is in the funnel is not producing what America needs. On the quantity side first, if we look at, and this is, this is um, in some of Alex's publications as well, it is true that we still lead the world in the percentage of our 55 to 64-year-olds who have a college degree. But if we drop that down to 35 and over in the aggregate, we drop to second. Most troubling for me, though, is when you look at the 25 to 34-year-old cohort in the United States, in just the last few years, we've dropped from seventh to eighth to now tied with three other countries for tenth. So the younger folks, the younger generation in this country is not getting a college degree. If we look at 17-year-olds um, today, in 10 years, in 10 years, less than 20%, um, 17% will have a college degree. And if we look at um, today's freshmen in, 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 in high school, and you project out for the next 10 years, at the end of it, 75% of those students that are from upper income will have earned a college degree, but less than 10% will have earned a college degree. So the funnel is getting narrower and narrower, ultimately ending up with a younger generation that has less education than, than generations before that. So let's look at the quality piece of that. Anne talked about what employers are finding after college. Um, for those of you that have read, and, and I encourage you if you haven't read Alex's publication on the 10 questions every elected state official should ask of the higher, edu um, higher education institutions in your state, I encourage you to read it and reread it. The only thing that I will quibble with is 60 percent, six out of the 10 questions have to do with the quality of education. Questions three through six have to do with what happens in the high school experience, and questions seven and eight have to do with what happens in the college experience. As Alex says in the publication, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of remediation. Um, today, less than half of our 17-year-olds, less than half of our 17-year-olds have the math for factory floor jobs. And if we look at high school students who have shown an indication to go to college, that is, they've taken the ACT, two-thirds are not ready for college-level math, and one-third are not ready for college-level English. That leads to a lot of remediation on college campuses across the United States. More than three-quarters of college campuses have to engage in remediation efforts, either in reading, math, or English. And if we look at the students themselves, 60% um, of community college students need at least one course in remediation, and 25% of students at four-year colleges need remediation. 40% of the colleges have students in remediation for over a year. And we know that students that need remediation are about 40% less likely to earn that ultimate degree. So when you have 
what you have happening at the high schools, what's happening at the colleges, and ultimately what's happening um, with the workforce, with the employers of the workforce, you see that we have not only a diminishing funnel, but what's in the funnel and coming out is not ready for today's workforce needs. So I referenced earlier the conversations that take place across the private sector, post-secondary institutions, and American families. And I would say that the conversations, if I had to come up with one word to sum up the role of the private sector, the role of government, and the role of the institutions themselves, the word would be polarized. The conversation around higher education's responsibility to workforce development is either we're the best system in the world, we ain't broke, we don't need fixing, two, higher education is in serious need of reform or we're going to lose our global um, footing. Another conversation is, is it higher education's responsibility to develop the global citizen or to develop the global worker? When I was brand new to Washington, D.C. in November of 06, I attended a meeting of association heads. And as we talked about the priorities for implementing the Commission's recommendations, the head of one of the associations said to me, I'm a little concerned about the language that you're using. You use workforce development very frequently in your conversations. It's not our responsibility to educate workers. It's our responsibility to create global citizens. And of course, my argument would be, how can we be an effective worker if we're not an effective global citizen? But in essence, the conversations are, if we talk about the role of higher education, global citizens, workers. We're not broken. We need serious reform. If we look at the role of government through this crisis of too few and, and not qualified enough, you, you get the two camps as well. Either it's a free market system, we don't need any government oversight, to we have too much government regulation and we're not doing enough. And those that see the battles that need to take place are often marginalized by the two extremes. And then when we ultimately come to the private sector, a lot of the conversations around offshoring and why American companies are offshoring or outsourcing um, outside of the United States, or the level of investment that these companies are making in, in American higher education institutions. One of the saddest things for me during my time here in Washington, D.C., was no matter where I went across the country, we were engaged in the blame game. It was, if I was visiting corporate America, you should see what we're spending to train the employees that we're hiring from colleges. They're not coming out with the skills that we need. They're not effective com communicators. They can't work with others. They're not good time managers. I visited American colleges, and they would say, you should see what we're getting from public high schools. You visit public high schools, you should see what we're getting from the middle schools. You visit the middle schools, you should see what we're getting from the elementary schools, and so on. We're not going to be able to stop that blame game if we don't address the fact that we've got such polarized factions discussing American higher education and its relationship to workforce development. So my recommendation for a new relationship that has to exist between the private sector, read that high, um, American private enterprise, and higher education institutions is acknowledge that both do things well and engage in really learning from each other. I know that the obvious answer on what colleges and universities can learn from corporate is the efficiency. Corporations in the 80s and the 90s and their responsibilities to shareholders had to learn how to become more efficient by focusing on what are our core competencies and what do we outsource. But there's also an effectiveness that I think colleges and universities can learn from American enterprise. I do sit, as Ann mentioned, on the board of American Electric Power, and, and, and two of the things that I think that they do really nicely is they routinely reassign their leadership so that they create more well-rounded leaders by having them able to see all problems from various perspectives. 